Welcome back to Building Tomorrow, a podcast dedicated to all things tech and innovation from a libertarian perspective. I'm your host, Paul Matsko, and with me is Aaron Powell. We are returning to part two of an interview with John Aristotle Phillips, the founder of Predictit, the aptly named political prediction market, and the college student formerly known as the A-bomb kid. Yep, sometimes the truth actually is stranger than fiction, because if teenage designer of nuclear bomb who creates a betting market for politics isn't the best plot summary you've heard for an as yet unmade Coen Brothers film. I don't know what is, but back to the show. I know there's a relationship between, I, I think Aristotle was involved with some of the planning for Predict It, which is a political prediction market. Um, but it's based in New Zealand, out of a New Zealand university. Okay. Yeah. Explain a little bit of that. Sure. So Predict yeah. is my favorite subject. This is of uh, more than three decades in the business of in the business of politics. Uh, this is something to which I've contributed that I am proudest of. Predict it is just the coolest thing. And it's also a hell of a lot of fun. Are you guys predicted traders? We have some here in, I think, in the building. But sounds like a lot personally. Really. Yeah, you guys, <laughs> you guys are definitely unpredicted. All right, so pre predicted is, predicted is a what's called a prediction market. It's like a stock market where you buy and sell one dollar winner take all shares, where two people we put two people together. One person who thinks something's going to happen, the other person who doesn't think this thing is going to happen. Let's just take. Trump impeachment as an example. Mm -hmm. So right now you can buy a share, a, a single share of Trump to be impeached in 2019. I don't know if it's it maybe selling for 22 cents. Mm -hmm. That means if you put down 22 cents that says Trump will be impeached in 2019, you get a dollar if it happens. Or you can take the other side of that bet and you can uh, put down 78 cents that says he won't be impeached in 2019 and you get the dollar if he is not impeached. So if what happens is the opposite of what you predicted, you lose whatever you paid for that share. You're limited to $850 in any market. You can't buy more than $850 in a market. Uh, and the, what's cool about it is the price fluctuates by the second. So there are thousands and thousands of people who ha are holding these $1 winner-take-all contracts. Uh, and they're watching the news and engaging in trying to figure out, in this case, will Trump be impeached in 2019? And as the likelihood of Trump being impeached increases or decreases, so does that 22 cent share. It goes up in value, goes down in value based upon people bidding on it 24-7, 365. It's a, so that's predicted. Yeah. And we, we – uh, it's it's not an original idea to Aristotle. Prediction no, no. markets have been around a while. There was a there was Robin a, Hansen proposes yeah. them back in the nineties. In and, trade yeah. was a was a famously fun, but also eventually shut down by the Commodities Future Trading Commission. It was an Irish uh, gambling site, uh, but but making predictions or you know people conf, you know think of the stock market sometimes as gambling, right? Um, there's a lot of research that goes into whether you're going to buy a share and there's a lot of thinking that goes in research that goes into whether or not you think impeachment is going to happen or what you think the margin of victory is going to be or how many Senate seats the Republicans are going to pick up or the Democrats are going to pick up. All those things factor in. And what is, so the reason – and what's fascinating about predicted, to me anyway, is that they're so darn accurate. They're not 100 percent. It's not 2020 vision into the future but you're pulling back these curtains just a little bit. You're able to see a little bit through the fog and that's what prediction markets do. And the question is why? You know, Robin Hanson and others have been researching prediction markets for, for a long time. And the question really is why are markets accurate predictors of future events? How, how is it that – is it wisdom of crowds as some people would like you to believe? Is it insider information coming into the market and, and – causing the price to go up or go down on something like this? You know, what is it about it? Well, we know that markets um, are efficient – are highly efficient at distilling billions of pieces of information. And I, we could be talking about pork bellies or orange juice futures or the yeah. price of Tesla stock, OK? But we're happy to talk about Great political tra aspects. Great trading places reference. So right. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, 
but they distill billions of pieces of information and these are generally about uh, um, risk and value um, and it distills it into odds and prices. And that's what a market does. It's what a stock market does. So this is, if you think of this as a, as a market for politics where you can make all kinds of predictions and you can put your money where your mouth is. And then, of course, there's this whole comments board. You know, we have more than a million comments, for instance, on some of these markets. Uh, it's, a, it's great and it's great fun. And I still think you guys are traders. You're just not saying it. <laughs> so I, th this question of accuracy. So Predict it is a large portion of the data behind the website electionbettingodds.com, which was the – it was like it and 538 in 2016 and then again this year where the everyone in DC is obsessively hitting reload on yeah. these two sites. Yeah. Um, and – but but one of the, the things about giving a percentage happening of a one-time event, like will Trumper – Clinton win the election. That's a one-time event. And so if if predict it says that Trump has a 3% chance of winning and he wins, then predict it was still right. Um, and if predict it says that Trump has a 75% chance of winning and he wins, you'd still say it was right because these are like one time you can't repeat it to see you know out of 100 times running this election he won you know either 97 or he won well, because only 65 no to, you said because there's no way to empirically <clears throat> test right and so so when you're talking about its accuracy how are you getting to the question of its accuracy sure. if you're always in these kind of one off things sure well that's the old gag about washington everybody says that it's a 60% chance that something's going to happen right <laughs> that way you're right in either yeah, way no yeah, matter what right. happens right <laughs> uh, so so the, when we think of accuracy, first of all, your, the premise of the question is 100 percent correct in my opinion. Um, when you say something is is 20 percent chance that it's going to happen, you know that means you know 20 percent of the time that thing is supposed to happen, right? And the other times it's not supposed to happen because you can't repeat it and all this stuff. So what? How do you calculate accuracy? Well, there's something called a Breyer score, which is what you know people who study prediction markets like. It's not just being it's not just the odds are correctly cited with what actually happens, but how long in advance of the event and, and for how long it stays. Okay, because there's, there's a virtue to being right five minutes before the event, to being on the right side of a bet five minutes before the event occurs. But the greater virtue is being right on the right side of that same bet six months ago when you could have bought this share when everybody else was thinking the opposite was going to happen. So, the, you know, there are... There are biases that enter into it when you're, you know, there's long shot bias. There's all kinds of bias that, and, and it's fascinating how investors think about these things. And I'm not here to tell you I figured out how why why markets are as accurate. I, I gave you my theory, uh, but you know, I think it's probably a combination of things. I think in, I think information flows into the market rapidly. They are obsessively people are obsessively you know hitting the website trying to figure out. Uh, if the odds are going to change, it's what's really interesting is you follow something like the Kavanaugh nomination, you know, hearings, or that Kavanaugh would even be picked in the first place, and you can really, really see the market start to tip at at various points, almost in advance of what's going on in terms of the testimony, and 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 you also, you know, it, it's not just it's not just politics, of course. I mean. If you can predict, how interesting would it be to predict, you know, the 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 uh, month and the year, or just the year when the first human being is going to walk on Mars? You know, all that's all that stuff is like really subject to, and and again, you know, prediction markets and markets in general, and and forecasting elections. It's gone on for a long with money behind it. It's gone on a long, long time, like hundreds of years. You said that there's a – was a $850 cap on how much you can invest in, in a single, single market, market in here. Um, is that because of regulatory reasons and then does that – would we be more accurate if we didn't have those caps so people could dedicate even more money? So yes and yes. Both of – OK. So <clears throat> there's a there's a sort of regulatory history as to why – which you guys wanted to talk about. I'm happy to sort of – Shorten it for you, but basically, what we did was we, we New Zealand University of Victoria um, in New Zealand uh, had been running a prediction market and a and a good one um, 
we went to them. And polling is broken, as everybody knows, right? It's, it's expensive. It's hard to do. It, yeah, people don't want to answer questions on the phone anymore. Everybody's got cell phones. So it's really hard to get polling, uh, to get it right. And if you can harness, and our interest was, well, wow, look at these guys at Intrade, and they, they, you know, they they set this up, and also it's just a lot of fun. I mean, <laughs> any way you cut it, so um, we teamed with Victoria University and said we want to bring this to the United States, and the Commodities Future Trading Commission was was the government agency to whom Victoria took the request and got what's called a no action letter, and the no action letter stipulates some of these limits. Uh, you're, it's a balancing act in terms of the limits serve a useful function, although the limits could be and probably should be higher. Um, but the limits serve a useful function. They keep, you know, the question is, well, how do you keep a whale out of the market if a Russian whale wants to come in and buy a whole bunch of shares? And that happened with Intrade. And the irony with Intrade is they, they – Relieve the whale of more than a million of his dollars before the market settled back to the to the to what it what it would have been otherwise. So markets are very efficient at taking the money away from people who rely on fake news, and that's that's part of the, that's one of the other things about it, which is it's a potential antidote to fake news. If you are watching fake news or consuming fake news and you're drinking the Kool Aid, you probably should not be unpredicted because there there people unpredicted are going to relieve you of your money. So. When we talk about prediction markets and they really – I mean it seems like it was with with 2016 is when they became kind of a mainstream thing um, for – at least for people paying attention to the, the political races. Um, we, we say, well, these are more accurate than – like the kind of expert predictions are terrible. So the people who go on CNN and pontificate about who's going to win about horse rate politics are terrible. Um, and the polling is not that great or I mean – it's it has it has issues that you raised, but if those sources of information are not that great, um, where are the people who are betting on predict it getting their information? Like, what information are they acting on? Because they're not. I mean, these aren't like insiders in the political campaign. Usually, they're regular people. So uh, that's a great question. So what makes? I'll reframe the question. Okay. So uh, what makes a super forecaster? Because somebody at that 3%, it wasn't 3%, of course, but to use mm -hmm. the hypothetical, whoever picked the long shot at 3% did very well. Six months yeah. made a killing, right? <laughs> so, are, can you isolate the, it gets back to our original discussion about big data and databases and the like. Can you isolate the characteristics that make for a great forecaster? We call them super forecasters and just see what they're, what they're doing, right? And try to figure out wh how does this person, I mean, so for instance, and those questions haven't been answered yet. We have 100 and, we got 150 researchers at 85 plus research, you know, universities, so the head of, you know, economics department, the marketing department, the political science, international relations department. These, these teams of researchers are digesting the anonymized data that we provide to them. And trying to figure out what makes for a super forecaster. How is, you know, is a fat cat in the beltway, inside the beltway, a better predictor of the outcome of the Iowa Republican caucus than grandma, to use her that example again, who, you know, just reads the newspaper every day. Or maybe doesn't read the newspaper. Maybe doesn't pay any attention to it, but just, you know, she, she has some other methodology for figuring out what's going to happen. So what makes a super forecast? I don't can't answer that question for you, except that they probably have really good uh, BS detectors. So this actually conversation reminds me about the debate within stock market uh, prediction uh, uh, groups about whether or not you can truly beat the market, right? So there's the there's the whole move over the last 40 years towards index funds. You know, your Burton Malkiel ran the walk down Wall Street, even Warren Buffett saying that. You know, one of the most successful stock pickers of all time saying you shouldn't do this. This is not successful. Over time, you cannot beat the consensus of the market. Um, so there's like an there's an anti super forecaster sentiment that's been growing in stock market picking. Uh, is the same thing true in political prediction markets? Are there folks who are skeptical of of whether such a thing as a super political forecaster exists? Well, I mean, I, you're you're sitting across from somebody who's 
it was a case study for how not to pick stocks. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> I mean, so my four hundred and one suffers. You know, so anytime I I get involved, every time, every time I leave it alone, it does fine. <laughs> when I get involved, I'm sure something's going to happen. Yeah. You can pretty much bet against it. Uh, <laughs> so do as you say, not as you do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So that's you know, and and I'm not allowed to 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 uh, to play on predict it because I'm yeah. affiliated with Aristotle, right? right so, right, right. Um, so uh, your question was what was. So, I mean, it, do you see that? I mean, so you were talking about you're trying to find the super forecaster, but is the super forecaster a myth, a, a unicorn? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I mean, somebody's been, you know, people are making money. Right. And people yeah. are losing money. Yeah. And over time, the question, I mean, it's like the monkey, right? The monkeys throw the darts at the chart and the Thank stock you. picking chart. Right. So I wonder if, so if you had something like predict it, so you've got people who are logged in and making lots of bets on lots of things. And I, I, suspect that people who are really into it are betting on a lot of markets at the same time. Uh, but so I wonder if you had something like that then coupled with the kind of you know almost creepy level demographic data that Facebook gathers about you, if you could start like that question of then you could figure out, is it the fact that grandmas in the Midwest who make below a certain income are you know 40 percent more likely to predict the outcome of elections? Like you could I imagine really interesting information coming out of kind of aggregating all this data that's being gathered. Uh, you, the the analysis of what makes for you know accurate. It, it may be <coughs> that it's not it's not Svengali grandma. It may be that it's that it may be that markets just function, you know, in a certain in a certain manner, and they aggregate a lot of information. I mean, I don't use the. The, I don't use the term wisdom of crowds, but it, that may have something to do with it. You know, there's a, there's there's some. I think it's going to be fascinating to see what kind of research comes out of this, just in terms of in terms of why markets are so accurate, and, and they're not perfect, as I said, they're not 2020. Yeah. yeah. What's the I guess outside of the obvious value for investors who are participating in this, at least the value for the ones who win? Um, what's the long term value in prediction markets in this kind of mechanism of so if we you know we get better at predicting the outcome of campaigns really far in advance does that create kind of positive externalities that's a great question <clears throat> i haven't been asked that question before i don't know i don't know i have to think about that one i can imagine off the top of my top of my head thinking of this being an advantage to the kind of political outsiders that we started talking about when we're talking about aristotle where if you're not part of the two-party duopoly, um, it's just assumed the the received wisdom is going to be you don't stand a chance. But what ha that's not actually true. The chance is rarely ever zero. Maybe it's only 1% or 2% or 3%, but it gets you on the board. A prediction market gets you on the board, whereas received wisdom keeps you off the board entirely. And some small, yes, maybe it's only a 1% or 2% chance, but across thousands of elections across the country every year, some of those one or two percent chances are more likely to pay off if we listen to prediction markets rather than to expert opinion. Well, that, that's that's possible. So, so there are twenty at last count between the billionaires and the and the the senators and and the, and the wannabes. There's twenty candidates running for the Democratic nomination or possible candidates. This way, it's probably two hundred and twenty <laughs> right, right, possible. Yeah. But there's twenty that that. So we've got markets open on on them, right? Will they run? Then is the market on? Will they get the will, when? Will they announce? Will they get the nomination? Will they win the challenge? These are all different markets that you can you can go in on, and you can sort of see there's a bunch you know the two percenters right. There's a whole bunch of people like clustered down there, and itching to get up. Now that you know traditionally what happens is they wouldn't they give a good speech or have a good day or something, file a good financial report, and 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 you know that would that would go unnoticed, right? Um, unless they were anointed by the Washington press corps as being the front runner or the, you know, the dark horse that's catching fire, whatever that means, right? You've got the big mo, right? So, but the fact of the matter is the prediction markets are, are pretty adept at picking that stuff up. And so uh, it'll be really interested with this election cycle to sort of see how well they do in terms of and, and you know somebody may be in the front now and they may be at the back of the they may not even be a factor six months from now. What do you say to I mean there are going to be some folks listening to this who 
um, are going to kind of viscerally recoil at the idea of betting on political futures. I mean, to some extent with, with Aaron and I, you're preaching to the choir when it comes to, hey, markets can efficiently access information. It's a libertarian podcast after all. But there are going to be folks who have a visceral reaction to that. Um, what do you say to the idea that this is kind of ghoulish, this is unsavory, that politics aren't something you should think of as a crass, mechanistic, financial – you have a fi financial interest in, that you should vote your heart, not with your wallet or something? You know, I, I, I can imagine lots of objections along those lines. Right. So, so those who do well in – first of all, I don't have a, <clears throat> a perfect response to the – to the person who says it's, you know, there should be no money in politics. You know, that's an extension of that argument, which is, you know, not only should you not make money, but you should not put money into politics because, you know, you just encourage these politicians to do more of what they're doing, right? In any event, there are lots of objections, um, and and <clears throat> anything I'm involved in is never going to be pure enough for 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 to satisfy everybody or even many people, but. Uh, my my feeling is that this is in a this is one of those areas that I, that should be reviewed more as political speech. Uh, if you decide to to put your money where your mouth is, that to me is a pretty pure expression of democratic sentiment. Furthermore, uh, predict it does function, and this is another area that's being studied right now. So it's a little premature to give a to to jump to this conclusion. But if you ever come to the predicted parties we have, you know, it's debate night. Why they watch debates, or they it's election night parties, or we get, you know, we we open a bar, have a, a bar which is the political bar in the state capitol on election nights or nights when there are debates or something happening. Those places are packed, and you will see a whole generation of people who really are have many of whom have not been involved in politics before. But like sports fantasy or some of the other types of places where you've actually got some skin in the game, uh, you know, all of a sudden there is just this avid interest in in hanging on every word in the debate because you're trying to figure out if Donald Trump is going to say, you know, crooked Hillary in the tweet tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, so predict it is a, an engagement tool, mm -hmm. and I think one of the things that's going to come of this is we're going to discover that. That uh, especially the demographic that that does sports fantasy and does uh, you know Super Bowl, all this, but I think you're going to see greater engagement by that that demographic of young people who otherwise, you know, it's a bunch of people talking about politicians, a bunch of people talking about stuff that's not relevant to my life, and frankly, I never, I didn't see any of that tax cut. Uh, but if you've got 10 bucks writing on what's going to happen, you're going to pay attention. And it gets to another thing you just said, which is you, in a market, you're not supposed to vote with your heart. You're supposed to vote with your head, right? Uh, and that's kind of what Predict It does. It's amazing. If you guys uh, or if your audience goes to predictit.org, uh, you just put, you know, you can, you can open an account with as little as 10 bucks. If you put as little as 10 bucks down, you're going to see how it clears your head in terms of what you're making a prediction on, whether you're not, you know, it's who the 2020 Democratic nominee is going to be, Trump impeachment. You start to think, is that really worth 22 cents or should it be 23 cents? Maybe I'm going to put in an offer for 21. And, and that's how prediction markets, I think that's an element to why they're so accurate. <laughs> well, and it produces a certain degree of uh, uh, another positive social externality, just as, say, fantasy football encourages people who are previously casual consumers of football to learn more about the sport, to be more engaged. It increases the level of knowledge about this uh, venue. Yep. Uh, the same thing in, it would be true in politics, that the process of engaging exposes and, and maybe exposes them to new ideas, right? There was a certain way they were voting, you know, because that's what the, how their family voted. So they were party line voters in this way. But now that they have skin in, the, skin in the game, they're spending more and more time engaged with the issues, learning about the candidate, looking for – they're higher information voters. You are so right about that. And in fact, if I may, just one second. So uh, people who – the study shows that people who have a money riding on a football game are 44 more times more likely to watch football, the football games and, in fact, the season. Predicted or people who are involved in fantasy sports or, or betting on, on sports become voracious consumers of sports statistics. You just have to ask ESPN about this, right? They, they, you buy – you 
you consume. You you try to get as much of that information as you possibly can because you want to make the most yeah. accurate. Right. Yeah. What's the batting average? What happens on a rainy day? All that stuff. The same may be true with political prediction markets is that you become – real interested, real fast, even if you've only got 10 bucks writing on what's going to happen. And the, the, the corollary of that is there's a reward mechanism built in. As we said earlier, if you're, if you're making your predictions based on fake news, you're, you're not going to do so well. I just sort of be the kind of doom and gloom guy though to counter that. Does it run the risk that if I have bet a bunch of money on a slate of candidates, say, that when I then go to the polls, the person I'm going to vote for is not going to be the one who I think will govern the best, has the best principles, is the best at the job, but rather the person who I have predicted is going to win and so therefore my slate of candidates will pay off, which would seem to be – I mean it's it's good for my, the, my income, but it's not necessarily good for democracy if that's the reason we're picking candidates. That you may have a perfectly valid point. I, I don't know if I, – I, I talk to people who, who bemoan the fact that they put money on the opposite of what they're going to do because they, <laughs> they hedge their bets. So they said that way I'm not going to be disappointed when my candidate doesn't win, right? So there's that thing going on. How much of it is what you described, which is probably a lot? And how much is what I just anecdotally described to you? I don't know. But that's one of those things. I mean, wouldn't it be just interesting to know, look, our, our, who, who's, the better, who's the better predictor of the outcome of a Democratic or a Republican primary campaign? Is it somebody that's you know, a Democrat or Republican or independent? Or I don't know the answer to that. We're going to know the answers to some of those questions pretty soon, though. I, I still like the theory it's a, a Svengali grandma in, in the Midwest, <laughs> I think, clearly, uh, every time. Um, so why don't we move on for sake of time to your original title. Back before you were a CEO, back before you ran for Congress, you were known as the A-bomb kid, right? So – and this is uh, a, a quite a literal appellation. You were, a, as I understand it, an undergraduate at Princeton and you designed an atomic bomb, something that you know most undergraduates do usually by their sophomore <laughs> year. I, well, I was on academic probation at the time, oh, so okay. that's uh, you know they, they had to do something. Um, my thesis advisor was the eminent uh, physicist Freeman Dyson. That's one of those interesting fun facts to know and tell. So Freeman was told me when I set out to do this. This is a junior. Uh, thesis is what they have. So you do these in your junior year. You pick a topic and you dig into it and you ignore your other classes and you're supposed to do. So that's that's what this that's what this project was. Um, you know, F Freeman informed me from the first day when I asked him to be my thesis advisor. He wasn't going to be able to help me with any of this uh, because he had security clearances. And I, <clears throat> frankly, nobody thought I was going to succeed anyway. Uh, you know, at, at coming close. But yes, that's that. Uh, that happened, and uh, it was it was quite a roller coaster. After that, um, it was uh, you know the point was to see how difficult it would be for a terrorist group or a uh, criminal organization or even a third world country to build a bomb, which I didn't do. I just designed it, right? right? And the the premise, much of the debate at the time about proliferation, it, it's eerily similar to the debate now, but. Much of the debate about proliferation of nuclear weapons was that you didn't need to tighten up security around plutonium and uranium, the raw ingredients for an uh, atomic bomb, because it would take a Manhattan Project to design and then build a bomb. And therefore, we should be lax in exporting technology and materials around the world because places like Pakistan would never be able to come up with an atomic bomb. It was this, sort of this hubris. Um, <clears throat> which proved not to be the case. And, and as, a, as a result of a lot of work by people who are very concerned about proliferation and been working the issue for a long, long time, especially you know, in Washington, Democrats and Republicans, um, uh, a, um, some of the – there were curbs placed on – on the spread of some of the technology, mostly plutonium reprocessing facilities. This is a whole great subject for another podcast. Yeah, uh, I'm yeah. happy to talk about it. Uh, you know, this is like I had a bit role in this whole thing, but um, it was sort of a punctuation mark, I guess, for you know, for for the proliferation debate because once 
once I did what I did, then it sort of took ripped the rug out from underneath the argument that you're not the secure fizzle material. Well, so I have to ask. You said you, you designed one, but you didn't build one. Yeah. But could you have? Uh, the question is, could I have without killing myself? Uh, right. Sure. <laughs> yeah. well, there like, was, there was that kid who built one in his shed, the Boy Scout in Michigan, who built one in his potting shed in the 90s and <laughs> may have, yeah, irradiated himself pretty severely. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it would not have been uh, a trivial matter uh, if you have p- – part of the – part of the – the unfortunate part about the whole thing is that – the whole subject is that um, – even if you – you know, the, the, the atomic bombs that were, that were used over uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki only consumed a fraction of the fissile material. So they were not what we would call efficient, an efficient design. A lot of the work – so, you know, in, a lot of the work around atomic uh, nuclear devices is to make it, and if, make it efficient so they can be smaller, so they can go on the top of a warhead, that sort of thing, or unfortunately in a suitcase somewhere. So the the, the – and and failure if you create a dirty bomb, right? If that's your intention, you set out to create a dirty bomb. You don't really, you know, you're 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 striving to do something different than create an efficient uh, device. So uh, th- there's, you know, there's still very good reason to uh, to tighten, keep security tight on these materials. And there, you know, there's there. Personally, I think we, we were in a much more precarious situation, especially with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, it was an example of – at the time, it wasn't perfect. But it was an example of you know, uh, bipartisan support uh, and international support to get these to, – to stop these, from, these weapons from falling into the wrong hands. And, and how, successful, how successful we were, there's evidence of that because we're, we're here today. But, you know – I don't. It sounds like don't something we need threat. a betting market on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I think we'll avoid that one. <laughs> so yeah. that that um, thesis made you something of a household name. Lots of talk show uh, circuit appearances. Uh, you're the first 24 year old not involved in fronting a rock band to get like a cover article in Rolling Stone, <laughs> as, as far as I as far as I know. Yeah. Um, and you. You kind of leveraged some of that fame to run for Congress. We right. talked about those yep. campaigns in Connecticut in 80 and 82. So what made you decide to switch from being the, you know, the front, the, the face of a campaign and then the next year after that second failed bid is when you start Aristotle. Right. Like, so what's going on in your head as you go from, you know, young – and I think by the standards of the time, maybe not by the standards of 2016, 2018, you were considered fairly liberal on a lot of policies yep. in 1980, 82. Yep. Like, how do you decide to go from that to running a bipartisan political campaign platform? So so it was those experiences – so first of all, you know, my brother and I were broke. So we had to – we needed a job. And so the, the, the thing we knew how to do was to run a campaign which didn't succeed in the general election but did succeed in the primary camp, election campaign. Uh, and and so it was, it was a um, – we loved the campaign, the, the democratic process itself. It's it's fascinating. I mean, it's how people come together, how they try to articulate their point of view. It was highly inefficient. Computers were just the brand new thing, and 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 we felt, based on my my what my the program my brother had cobbled together for the campaign, that this is an area where you know some there's room for growth and there's also room for, a lot of room for improvement. It was just too hard to run a political campaign in those days if you didn't you know even if you had the blessing of the party. It was just really really hard and it shouldn't be that hard. It should be easy to you know to get your point of view across. Yeah. And 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 then let the voters make a decide. It's a one day sale. You let the voters make a decide as to how much merit your ideas have and that's the basis on which I know it sounds, you know, naive, but the fact of the matter is that is Pretty much what Aristotle's dedicated itself to, you know, in this intervening period of time, is to try to make it easier for points of view which may not be mainstream or mainstream to be heard by voters, so that they, because ultimately voters make the right choice. You know, in all these elections we were involved in, ultimately they they weigh, you know, their own personal circumstances, but also what they think is best for their their community or their country. Um, and their neighbors, and and that's how they that's how they cast their ballot. Hmm. Um, 
one last thing, I think, unless you have something, Aaron. Um, as I was reading the the Rolling Stone interview, actually, there was this this is the section uh, where you talked. I mean, this is 1980, so it's been a while. You talked about admiring like the great figures in history, like Joan of Arc, Alexander the Great, Napoleon. Uh, you wanted to be like the ancient Greeks who tried to make a substantive contribution in one's lifetime as a way of leaving a legacy that outlived you. So I'll just talk about like. I want to be preserving civilization rather than, than you know, destroying civilization. Um, you also mentioned like a childhood dream of being an astronaut. Yeah. In all this, so young, political, relative political radical for the time, trying to get into politics in the late 70s, early 80s, um, these big dreams and visions. And actually while reading that, I thought of some another politician, Newt Gingrich. Someone who's also obsessed with space travel, loves history. It, you know, it might sound like a bit more of a, uh, a, a uh, I don't know if that's a compliment in, given the trajectory of his career. But it's interesting to me that there might be something about your generation who are coming of age in the 70s. So it's post New Left, post 1960s. They have you had a big vision, but also saw a lot of really systematic institutional problems in America mm -hmm. and wanted to do something about it. Albeit, I assume your solutions in 1980 were rather different from Newt Gingrich's, but some of that same energy. I, what that puts in mind, me in mind now, I think for the, my final question, would the you know, 1980, 24-year-old liberal wunder kid who invented the atomic bomb and then ran as a radical Democrat for Congress, like... Would he be happy with you now, the 60 some year old, you know, oh, uh, I'm sure, CEO? I'm sure of grossly Aristotle. disappointed. <laughs> I, uh, I was, you know, uh, my, my viewpoints when I ran f for Congress were, would today be considered pretty much mainstream oh, yeah. or conservative. I mean, that's the irony it of it, like right? Medicinal marijuana. Yeah. And, and so yeah. I, you know, I ended up, uh, uh, look, what I what I do look, I think what I what I what I'm involved in, what my company's involved in, th in things like predicted, they're, they're they're I think these are these are important sort of endeavors, right? And and I I've been very lucky. They're also I I, I want to stress how much fun it yeah, it is yeah, yeah. to be doing what I do. I really enjoy being the CEO of a company, mm -hmm. and I really enjoy. It gives me the opportunity to do stuff like predicted. Or look how fascinating it is to be able to go to a foreign country and be able to help manage a political campaign. Try to get your arms around what's going on, and how I told you earlier on, it's invigorating. It's inspiring. You see people waiting in the sun for hours to vote in an election where you know you're trying to make sure that the votes are all counted, et cetera. It's just it's great. So I have I have no regrets about that. I don't think I would have, for the record, I don't think I would have made a very good congressman. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so either, and that's a compliment. All right, for there sure. You go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I do think the uh, the ancient Greeks would approve. So I think your 1980 version would be happy. Uh, and that's all for today. Uh, and until next week. Be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.